Okay, shalom everyone and welcome to another Thursday night psalm study. We are on Psalm 78. We are on part B, so this is the second half of the first half of the psalm study. Um, we look at the psalm and the Hebrew, the Aramaic, and the, the Septuagint and then um, see what we can discover. And then we look at, in the second half we look at the rabbinic commentary. But this week or at least Psalm 78. It was so long, there were there were a lot of verses, so I had to split it into two. So um, we're on part 1b, and so uh, before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful time that we could gather together, Lord. Thank you for um, helping the electronic equipment to work so that we can that I could be here. And Lord, I ask that you would uh, speak to our hearts tonight and help us to apply your word to our lives for your glory. And we give you all the glory and the honor and praise in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, we only read half the psalm last time, and so we'll read the other half tonight here. And I'm on page 10 on the study, if you go to the PDF. And we are starting at Psalm 78, verse 37. And it says the following. It says, For their heart was not steadfast toward him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. But he, being compassionate, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. And often he restrained his anger and did not arouse all his wrath. Thus he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes and does not return. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Again and again they tempted God and pained the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power, the day when he redeemed them from the adversary, when he performed his signs in Egypt and his marvels in the field of Zon, and turned their rivers to blood and their streams they could not drink. He sent among them swarms of flies which devoured them and frogs which destroyed them. He gave also their crops to the grasshopper and the product of their labor to the locust. He destroyed their vines with hailstones and their sycamore trees with frost. He gave over their cattle also to the hailstones and their herds to bolts of lightning. He sent upon them his burning anger, fury and indignation and trouble, a band of destroying angels. He leveled the path for his anger. He did not spare their soul from death. He gave over their life to the plague and smote all the firstborn in Egypt, the first issue of their virility in the tents of Ham. But he had led forth his own people like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. He led them safely so that they did not fear, but the sea engulfed their enemies. So he brought them to his holy land, to this hill country which, he, which his right hand had gained. He also drove out the nations before them and appointed them, or apportioned them for an inheritance by measurement and made the tribes of Israel, Israel dwell in their tents. Yet they tempted and rebelled against the Most High God and did not keep his testimonies, but turned back and acted treacherously like their fathers. They turned aside from a treacherous bow, for they provoked him with their high places and aroused his jealousy with their graven images. When God heard, he was filled with wrath and greatly abhorred Israel, so that he abandoned the dwelling place at Shiloh, the tent which he had pitched among men, and gave up his strength to captivity and his glory into the hand of the adversary. He also delivered his people to the sword and was filled with wrath, wrath at his inheritance. <clears throat> Fire devoured his young men and his virgins had no wedding songs. His priests fell by the sword and his widows could not weep. Then the Lord awoke as if from sleep. Like a warrior overcome by wine, he drove his adversaries backward. He put on them an everlasting reproach. He also rejected the tent of Joseph. It did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. He built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth which he has founded forever. He also chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. From the care of the ewes with suckling lambs he brought him to shepherd Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with his skillful hands. Okay, so that was verse 72. So there are 72 verses in uh, Psalm 78. And so part 
1B is down on page, let's scroll down here. Uh, okay, it's on page 23. Okay, so in Psalm 78, we read of the wisdom of Asaph according to his Torah. You remember last week, we started out in the study looking at what Asaph said in verse 1. It says that uh, Asaph said, or the Psalm says, it's a masculine or the wisdom of Asaph. And listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. And we see here in the Torah, in the, or sorry, in the uh, Hebrew text, in the Masoretic text, it says, Torati is my people are to heed or to listen to his law, his Torah, his instruction. And um, Asaph, he continues in his instruction. He says, starting with, um, for this week, with verse 37, it says, uh, yeah, just verse 37, it says, Fear their heart. Or, sorry, for their heart was not steadfast toward him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. And okay, so then the Aramaic Targum it states, because their heart was not faithful to him, they did not believe in his covenant. Okay, so we see Asaph speaking of faithfulness in the covenant, and the question is, what is the difference between being faithful to God and believing in the covenant of God? What do you think? What's the difference between being faithful to God and believing in the covenant of God? Because Asaph said that uh, for their heart was not steadfast towards him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. Okay. And what is in in the Aramaic Targum it was because their heart was not faithful to him and they did and they did not believe in his covenant. And so that's where I got that question from. But being faithful and believing in the covenant is related to being obedient to the covenant agreement that has been made between those who are making or who have made a covenant with one another. And according to the scriptures, the faithfulness of God is true. And he has, been, he has shown us his faithfulness over and over again. The author of Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18 states that the Lord does not lie, nor does he break a promise that he says he will fulfill. Every covenant he made... Uh, he kept. In the scriptures we read testimony after testimony of God's faithfulness and we know this to be true in each life that has been changed in the Messiah Yeshua. And if we do a statistical analysis of the Tanakh and the Apostolic writings it reveals that the accounts of covenants between the Lord God and his people occurs approximately 277 times in the scriptures. And one, what I did was I looked at the uh, Judaic's classic software, and I, I searched in the uh, in the Tanakh, at least the books that are available, because not all of the Tanakh is available in the Judaic classics, at least the the one that I have. And but it, it came up with quite a few, or over 200. And then I looked in the Apostolic writings, so I got about 277 times. <clears throat> in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, it states, "Know therefore that the Lord your God is God; He is a faithful; He is the faithful God, keeping His covenant of love to a thousand generations, to those who of those who love Him and keep His commands." Asaph, however, mentions that the people were not faithful to God, and neither were they faithful to His covenant. Faithfulness to the Lord is connected to the one who loves the Lord, loves His ways, and walks and serves Him according to His word meaning that the person who is faithful is obedient to the commands because of his love for the Lord. The one who does not love the Lord is not interested in obeying the commands. And there are those, however, who state that they do love the Lord but refuse to be obedient to, com to the commands, saying that grace covers all. And um, I know everyone here has um, heard that before. But um, what's interesting is in the Aramaic Targum it says because their heart was not faithful and then they did not believe in the covenant. And so what, um, what I'm trying to look at here, at least the, the thing that I was thinking of, was with regard to uh, a person's heart. You know, a lot of times in the scriptures, we, and even in our own lives, that our heart is described as something that, um, what we really believe. You know, like we, we love our spouse, we love our children, you know, and that something that we hold very dear 
or our spouse or our children are very, we hold very dear to our, in our hearts um, or near to our hearts. And so the idea that um, the not believing in the covenant and not being faithful at the heart were connected in the sense of in the sense that obedience to the command comes being motivated by the love that we have for God. Okay, and there are some who um, and the the strange thing is is that when when you talk about the love that we have for God, there. There, for so many years and centuries it's been taught that the law has been done away with that some people have a very difficult time reconciling that we out of our love we are to obey God according to his commandments and I've um, run into some people um, yeah Ellie says the Bible you obey is the only Bible you believe in that's right and the the I've run to, into some people on Facebook that are just so vehemently against the law of God that um, it just blows my mind. But um, it just reminds me of something that that I called sloppy grace, and I, I've been told that that that's that's really a bad way of putting it. But um, I the, the the point is when I say sloppy grace, I'm trying to emphasize the issue. You know, try, really trying to emphasize the issue here and um, I don't believe that we should be sloppy in our service to the Lord because that does not bear the testimony of a faithful people you know and and so that I don't know if I had discussed that any further than that but that that's um, was my thoughts on that and then Asaph he continues and then he says the following and I, I list on page 24 of the um, of the, the psalm study Psalm 78 verse 38 to 51 and it says the following from the Masoretic text but he being compassionate forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them and often he restrained his anger and did not arouse all of his wrath thus he remembered that they were fresh or sorry but they were that they were but flesh a wind that passes and does not return. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Again and again they tempted God and painted, or sorry, pained the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power the day when he redeemed them from the adversary, when he performed his signs in Egypt and his marvels in the field of Zone, and turned their rivers to blood and their streams they could not drink. He sent among them swarms of fly that flies that devoured them and frogs which destroyed them. He gave, uh, you know, and it's interesting is that how do flies devour and frogs destroy? I don't think I talked about that, but I just noticed that this time. That's interesting that Asaph says that flies devoured and um, frogs destroyed. You make flies, I don't know. Okay, so. And he goes on, and we gave also their crops to the grasshopper and the product of their labor to the locusts. He destroyed their vines with hailstones and their sycamore trees with frost. You know, and, and here with frost, we don't read that. I don't. I didn't. Re I don't read that. I don't remember that in the Torah. You know about frost. But um, and then he goes on. He says he gave over their cattle also to the hailstones and their herds to bolts of lightning. He set upon them his burning anger, fury, and indignation and trouble, a band of destroying angels. He leveled a path for his anger. He did not spare their soul from death, but gave over their life to the plague and smote all the firstborn in Egypt, the first issue of their virility in the tents of Ham. Oh, really? If the flies were from PEI, what's PEI? <laughs> Okay, and then the Aramaic Targum, it states the following on these verses. It says, But he is merciful, atoning for their sins, and does not destroy them, and he frequently turns his anger, and he will not hasten all of his wrath against them. And he remembers that they were the sons of flesh, a breath that goes away and does not return. How they would rebel against him in the wilderness. They would cause anger in his presence in a desolate place. And they turned and tempted God and brought regret to the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his miracle and the day that he redeemed them from the oppressor, who set out his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Tanis. 
He turned their canals to blood, and they could not drink from their streams. He will incite against them a mass of wild animals and exterminate them, likewise frogs, and he will slaughter them. He, and he gave and handed over their grain to the grasshopper and their toil to the locust. And he stripped their vines with hail and their sycamores with locust. And he handed over their ha cattle to the hail and their flocks to the fire, sparks of fire. He will incite against them 250 plagues in the march, marshes of his anger. He will travel on the path of his harshness, not keeping their soul from death and handing over their cattle to the plague. And he slew all the firstborn in Egypt the beginning of their sorrow in the tents of Ham. And then the Septuagint, you can see there on page 25 and 26. I won't read through that because it's very similar to uh, the Masoretic text. That's the Greek, the Greek translation. Okay, so <clears throat> Asaph... Oh, okay, horseflies. Yeah, horseflies bite. They bite really hard, too. Yeah. Okay, so um, Asaph says that though the people have sinned, the Lord has compassion and forgives their sins. He says in verse 38, But he, being compassionate, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them, and often he restrained his anger and did not arouse all of his wrath. The Aramaic Targum translates, But he is merciful, atoning for their sins, and does not destroy them, and he frequently turns from his anger. He will not hasten all of his wrath against them. In the Masoretic text, it says, Yechaper Oven or Avon sorry Avon and suggesting that the Lord is atoning for the sins of people the Torah makes it clear that blood Dom is used as a means for consecration sanctification dedication devotion you know, etc as well as a means for atonement with God and remember also blood was used on the doorposts like what we read on the uh, you know the door doorposts are in Hebrews Mizuzot of the houses in Egypt and um, to escape judgment and death of the firstborn and later blood was used as a means for confirming the covenant that's given at Sinai. Note also that all of the instructions used in the Mishkan and the tabernacle were set apart and consecrated by blood. The Torah was used or sorry, the blood was used to make atonement for the soul upon the altar, as the Torah states in Leviticus seventeen eleven. Saying, saying that I have given it for you on the altar to atone for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for by the life. And then the Lord forgives. And when the Lord forgives, um, the, the question is, is, is Asaph saying that it is the Lord who atones and not man who is doing so? You know, because it said in the Aramaic translation that, or maybe this is what the rabbis are thinking, that they say that, atoning for, you know, he is merciful, atoning for their sins, okay? And it doesn't sound like the people are atoning for their own sins, you know, that, that God is bringing atonement or making atonement for their sins. And generally, the interpretation by most Christian commentators is that man earned his salvation by bringing the sacrifice to make atonement for himself. Here, however, the Psalm of Asaph is suggesting that it is the Lord who is making the atonement. The blood is connected to the holiness of life through a sacrific sacrificial death. Justice requires that sin is punished, whereby justice is... Um, give me a second here. Whereby justice is served by the shedding of blood. And remember, the scriptures teach that in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death and that the soul that sinneth dies, the soul that sins dies. And in the Torah, the system of animal sacrifices with blood in the Mishkan was meant to atone for sin, to mend the relationship man had with our Father in heaven. And it appears that through the appointment of the commandment it is the Lord who is bringing atonement in blood and not the person who has brought the animal. Another interpretation may be related to the priestly service. The priests acts in the name of God on behalf of the Lord and for the people to bring atonement. The work of the priest may function as the Lord himself making the atonement for his people, as Asaph is saying, or at least according to the rabbis. Um, specifically within the Hatat Korban or the Asham Korban, the, the sin offering or the, the guild offering, the worshiper would bring a kosher animal to the entrance of the Mishkan and place its 
his right hand on the animal's head, confessing his sins over the animal for the purpose of transferring his sin to the animal, something that was a function of faith. The animal was then slain and the blood was collected. We're told, according to the Talmud Bavli, Minachot 110a, in the life for life principle, the Lord accepted the animal in place of the worshiper, the one who had brought the offense against the Lord. And all of these concepts are coupled to the process of teshuva, in the sense of personal and communal teshuva, where one must have a truly repentant heart. Note that during Yom Kippurim, uh, Leviticus 16 outlines the tabernacle um, procedure for atonement on a national scale, saying, For on this day atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you from all of your sins. So shall you, sh you shall be clean before the Lord. And this day is marked, you know, in Yom Kippur is marked uh, by repentance, prayer, and fasting all day long. Leviticus 16 verse 21 states, And confess over, all the in over it all the iniquities and the transgressions of the Israelites, whatever their sins. And so it is the high priest who confesses the sins of the people which have occurred on an individual level within a context of a national atonement. And this applies a more, implies a more intimate relationship with the high priest to each individual that's found within the commandment to confess the sins of the people before God. The Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, is a day which culminates a period of deep introspection about our relationship with God that is supposed to be preceded by a period in which we ask individuals that we have wronged to, to forgive us. And during Yom Kippur, the following confession is made. It says that for all of these sins, O God, of forgiveness, forgive us, pardon us, grant us atonement. In seeking the Lord's forgiveness, asking Him to forgive, pardon, and grant atonement, note that the Hebrew words that are used is salach, machal, and kefir. And within the three words that are used here, we find uh, forgive, pardon, and atonement. And there is something that's very important to understand based on the biblical text that the word forgive, in some cases in the sense of forgive and forget, whereas in other cases, a sin may be forgiven, but not totally forget, forgotten. And this is in the context of our seeking the forgiveness of sins. does not necessarily cause the consequential punishment for sin to be erased. For example, in Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 20, it says the following, In those days and at that time, declares the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought, and there shall be none. The sins of Judah and none shall be found. For I will pardon those I allow to survive. So in Jeremiah's ideal future, the sin is completely removed and disappears. The sins begin, or sorry, being forgiven and removed, however, does not necessarily cause the consequences to, re to be removed as well. For example, after the sin of the spies in the book of Numbers, Moshe asks God to forgive the sin of the people, saying the following, he says in Numbers chapter 14, verses 19 to 20, it says, Pardon, I pray, the iniquity of this people according to your great kindness, as you have forgiven this people ever since Egypt. And the Lord said, I pardon as you have asked. Note how Moshe asks the Lord to forgive the people's sins, which is a key reference from the Tanakh, which appears in the Silichot prayers, the forgiveness prayers, as a precedent for God forgiving us. However, this forgiveness is not like that of Jeremiah, as the following verses make clear that the sin is in some sense forgiven where the entire nation was just not utterly destroyed right then and there. But the consequences of the sin uh, is not erased because all that generation died in the wilderness you know, for the next 40 years. We read in Numbers chapter 14, verse 22, My presence and the signs that I have performed in Egypt and in the wilderness these things reveal to us that the power of God is present to overcome anything. And the power of God is present to forgive sins as well. And the point is, is that though sin is forgiven, the consequences of punishment will very likely continue to follow. The point is, is that confession of sin, even of the most sincere type, does not automatically imply the removal of sin's consequences. And some sins have lasting consequences. And 
And the most we can hope for is that the consequences be mitigated through the mercy of God via His great compassion and grace, seeking the Lord in helping us to walk through the consequences of our sin and continue to bring glory to His name in teshuva and repentance. Now, though the Lord knew the future sins of the people, we read in the Torah and in the Psalm that He led His people when Asaph states the following in, in verse 52 to 55. But he led forth his own people like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. He led them safely so that they did not fear, but the sea engulfed their enemies. So he brought them to his holy land, to this hill country which his right hand had gained. He also drove out the nations before them and apportioned them for an inheritance by measurement and made the tribes of Israel dwell in their tents. And in the Aramaic, the corresponding Aramaic verses that says that and he led his people like a flock and guided them like a sheep flock in the wilderness and he settled them securely and they did not fear and the sea covered their enemies and he brought them into the territory of the site of the temple the same mountain that his right hand had created and he drove out the Gentiles before them and settled them in the lot of his inheritance and settled the tribes of Israel in their tents so the Lord led the people, guiding them to their destination. In Isaiah 42, verse 16, it states that, I will lead the blind by a way they do not know. In paths they do not know, I will guide them. I will make darkness into light before them, and rugged places into plains. These are the things I will do, and I will not leave them undone. So the Lord says that he will lead the blind and bring them to their own land as a blind people that need guiding and that he would remove the obstacle that is in their way. The Targum states that the Lord led the people to the territory of the site of the temple and the Masoretic text states that he brought them to the Holy Land. The blind is a reference to the people who do not recognize the significance of going into the land and the power of God to deliver the land into their hands. They were not only blind but spiritually ignorant, ignorant of what the Lord had given them his Torah, and the importance of trusting and relying upon him. Now, Asaph continues, and he says the following. He says, um, and I'm on page 28, Yet they tempted and rebelled against the Most High God and did not keep his testimonies, but turned back and acted treacherously like their fathers. They turned aside like a treacherous bow, for they provoked him with their high places and aroused his jealousy with their graven images. When God heard, he was filled with wrath and greatly abhorred Israel, so that he abandoned the dwelling place of Shiloh, the tent which he had pitched among men, and gave his strength to captivity and his glory into the hand of the adversary. He also delivered his people to the sword and was filled with wrath at, wrath at his inheritance. Fire devoured his young men and his virgins had no wedding songs. His priest fell by the sword and his widows could not weep. Then the Lord awoke as if from sleep, like a warrior overcome by wine. He drove his adversaries backwards. He put on them an everlasting reproach. He also rejected the tent of Joseph and did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. And he built a sanctuary like the heights, like the earth, which he had founded forever. And then the, the Targum, it says, and it's a little, the rabbis, it looks like they expand on this text somewhat. They say, But they tempted and provoked in the presence of God Most High, and they did not keep his testimony, and they relapsed and did evil like their fathers. They became, became bent like a bow that shoots arrows, and they caused anger in his presence with their libations, and they made him jealous with their idols and images. It was heard in the presence of God, and he became angry, and his soul was very disgusted with Israel. And he abandoned the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent where his presence did abide among the sons of men. And he handed over his Torah to captivity, and his splendor to the hand of the oppressor. And he handed over his people to those who slay with the sword and become angry with his inheritance. The fire consumed his young men, and his young women were, respected, were not respected. His priest will fall with the killing of the sword, and his widows had no time to weep. Another Targum, at the time when the Philistines captured the Ark of the Lord, the priest of Shiloh, Hophni and Phinehas fell by the sword. And at that time, when they 
informed his wives, they did not weep, for they too died on that same day. And the Lord woke up like a sleeper, like a man who opens his eyes from, from wine. And he smote his oppressors on their behinds with hemorrhoids. He gave them eternal disgrace. And he was disgusted with the tabernacle spread over the territory of Joseph. And he took no pleasure in the tribe of Ephraim. But he was pleased with the tribe of Judah, uh, with Mount Zion that he loves. And he built his sanctuary like the horn of the wild ox, fixed like the earth that he found, founded forever and ever. Okay, so... Um, and in the Septuagint there, I won't read through that because it's very similar to the um, the New American Standard Bible. And um, so, you know, what's interesting that when we read through this, how the rabbis expand on the Aramaic Targum. And you can see that how they, they say that um, how God has rejected Joseph and Ephraim. And he did not respect the tent over which they had spread out. And it really it reminds you of um, of Jeroboam and the the sins that he had committed, and um, you know setting up those idols and you know, those two idols and causing Israel to sin greatly. And um, but it it, uh, it looks like that is what they're talking about. Um, so. Asaph, he states that the people were unrighteous and that they rebelled, according to the Masoretic text, and they, that they had provoked the Lord and did not keep his testimonies. And the, so the question is that, you know, they say that he says that they did not keep God's testimony. What is the significance of keeping the testimony of God? What do you think? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? What's the significance of keeping the testimony of God? What does it mean to keep the testimony? When thinking on the meaning of a testimony, we are reminded of the Torah mandate that the testimony of one witness is insufficient. It must be established by two or three witnesses. And in Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, um, is where we get that, that the, the um, establishing a testimony by two witnesses. Um, notice in the Torah all the miracles that God the Lord provided for the deliverance of, e of Israel each one functions as a testimony of the mercy of God the Lord bears witness in his word by the way he delivered Israel again and again and his testimony has been established by two or three witnesses as stated in Deuteronomy 19 verse 15 in Deuteronomy 19 the testimony is a verbal confession of what had happened and in Psalm, in the Psalm here, Asaph says, says that they did not keep his testimonies. And, the, you know, so what is a testimony that is kept? What do you think about that? And the testimonies appears to be a reference to the traditions, such as Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. The testimony is a visible reminder of God's supremacy and power to deliver. And keeping the testimony is the proclamation of God, of God as Lord and Savior. And in Isaiah 43, verse 8 to 13, the prophet depicts the nations as forming a legal assembly to proclaim the, su the superiority and saving work of their gods. However, their case proves groundless since their gods are blind, they have eyes that do not see, and they are deaf. They have ears that do not hear. The idol gods of the nations were constructed of common materials, and their makers were men. The Lord God, whom we serve, was not made by human hands. He is the creator of all things, and thus the message of the nations is nothing but a lie. The nations have no case since their gods are unable to support their claims. Israel, however, is told to take on the testimonies of God as a witness, to proclaim his power as Lord of all, and that apart from him there is no salvation. The point and the importance of the testimonies is found not only within the traditions but also in the way in which one lives his or her life before God. And this is the meaning of the phrase, the testimony of Yeshua, that is mentioned four times in the book of Revelation. And in Revelation chapter 1 verse 2, John refers back to the first verse which states that God gave Yeshua the Messiah this special message and the Messiah in turn sent it to John by an angel. In other words, the book of Revelation is the testimony of Yeshua. Revelation chapter 12 verse 17 states that the true ecclesia, 
has this testimony and keeps the commandments of God. Notice the parallel here to Asaph's words. The unrighteous generation rebels and provokes the Lord by not keeping his commands, his testimonies, whereas the righteous have faith and do keep his commands. And this is the meaning of what Yeshua said in John chapter 15, verse 14. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. The commandments of God and the Messiah's instructions are one and the same. And in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, the angel quickly restrains John from worshiping him. Instead, the angel said, Worship God, for the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. And we know, as we've studied previously, that prophecy can either refer to the foretelling of the future or it can be a reference to inspired teaching. We also learn that um, the phrase, the spirit of prophecy in the rabbinic literature, is always within the context of studying Torah, living righteously in the presence of God resting upon his people. And so this statement that the angel makes to John in Revelation 19 verse 10 is rich with rabbinic and Torah context that takes us right back to Asaph's words, the people rebelled and provo provoked God and did not keep his testimonies, whereas the righteous people do not provoke God and live in the testimonies. They live according to his commandments. And this is what John meant in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11. It states, And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Eternal life in the Messiah is characterized by righteousness, truth, justice, and holiness. The testimonies of God is undeniably a, refer a reference to the Torah and the importance of God's people to observe the Torah commands, the precepts, and the statutes. The Lord God has historically time and again revealed himself to Israel and redeemed them from oppression of the enemy. God's revelation of himself to Moshe, the giving of the Torah, the abiding presence in the tabernacle, and his redemption of Israel functions as a witness and our living things, these things today, not only in the moral imperatives that are found in the Torah, but also in the, in the traditions, we are proclaiming the evidence of God's power to redeem, deliver, and save lives. The testimony is equivalent to a proclamation of truth. Our lives today present historical evidence attesting to God's power as creator and sustainer Redeemer, Deliverer, and Savior. Okay. And then Asaph, he concludes his psalm, and he says in verses 70 to 72, He also chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. For the care of the ewes, from the care of the ewes with suckling lambs, he brought him to, the, to shepherd Jacob his people, and Israel his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with his skillful hands. The Aramaic Targum, it states, And he was pleased with David his servant, and took him from the flocks of sheep. And he brought him away from following after sucklings to rule over Jacob his people, and over Israel his inheritance. And he reigned over them in the perfection of his heart, and he will guide them by the understanding of his hand. And in the Septuagint, it states, he chose David also his servant and took him up from the flocks of sheep. He took him from following the ewes great with young to be the shepherd of Jacob his servant and Israel is his inheritance. So he tended them in the innocency of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. Okay, so the Masoretic text states that the Lord chose David taking him from the sheepfolds and caring for those that are more helpless than he was. The Aramaic Targum states that the Lord was pleased with David. And before David was taken to serve Saul and chosen to be king, he lived a very simple and humble life taking care of sheep. David was a very modest youth. This may be understood by his looking after and taking care of his father's flock. His heart burned with a love for God and for his people, which he expressed in the Psalms that he had composed in, in laying on, uh, playing on the lyre. He also felt a deep love for his lambs and for every living creature. Whenever he brought out his flocks to pasture, we can imagine how he led the young lambs to graze upon the fresh, tender young grasses, for they did not yet have any teeth. He had great courage and was not afraid of any wild beast, wild animal. He had no fear except of the Lord God alone. 
And we're told that when the lion or the bear attacked his flocks and herds, David would rush to deliver and rescue and save the animal under his care from the beast. We're told in scriptures, even in spite of the knowledge that he himself was not to have a hand in building the temple of God, David continued his work serving the Lord and began to collect the materials needed for the building as well as the money to pay for it. All the treasures that he had assembled during his reign, the gold, the silver, and the copper, the precious stones, the wood, he had placed in the care of a man called Shabuel, a direct descendant of Moshe, was appointed to take charge of this treasury. King Solomon later had before him only the task of constructing the temple because he had all the materials that were needed. David's reign lasted for 40 years. The first seven he reigned in Hebron over the tribe of Judah and the remaining 30 Three, he reigned in Jerusalem over all of Israel. We see according to the scriptures that David was a man whose heart he had dedicated to the service of the Lord. And in his humility and innocence, the Lord was pleased to make him king, as Asaph states in Psalm 78 verse 72. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them them with his skillful hands. Okay, and so that concludes the, the commentary on the Psalm 78, so we'll close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the mercies you've shown us every day and the way of salvation that you've provided. Lord, we recognize that the scriptures were given as a way to remember your great and mighty work in the past, the present, and the future. You have a plan for the redemption of your people, and we ask for help, for strength, and the resolve to live with the expectant hope of you working in our lives daily. Lord, we thank you for the promises that you have made and your continual, continued faithfulness to us. Help us, Lord, to keep our feet on the path of righteousness and truth according to your word and also have the desire to walk in your ways. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the faith to believe in Yeshua the Messiah and for always calling our hearts back to you, Lord. Please have mercy on us. Forgive us of our sins. We thank you, Lord, for sending your Son, Yeshua, that we may enter into the covenant of the peace that you have promised to your people. Help us to grow in our faith, to walk in the Spirit, and apply these truths to our lives. We praise your holy name and give you all the honor and the glory and the praise forever and ever. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Okay.